All right, for this video, I wanted to go through a Schedule K-1 walkthrough for a Form 1120S S Corporation. So we've got a sample K-1 here for our shareholder, John Smith. He's a 20% shareholder in an S Corp. So we've got his K-1 and we've also got his Form 1040. Uh, so we can look at all the items on the K-1 and see how those get transferred over to his individual tax return. So the K-1 includes page one. Uh, which has a number of items uh, filled in, others that don't apply or left blank. And then we've also got some supplemental information here that's included with the K-1 package. We've got a, a loan statement on shareholder loans to the S Corporation. We've got the QBI information from Section 199 Cap A. We've got a basis worksheet for our taxpayer here, John Smith. And then we've also got the K3 notification, which lets the shareholder know that we are not gonna be receiving a Schedule K3. All right, and then lastly, we've got one slide here just outlining the fact pattern. So we have a little more details and kind of background on, on how this K1 is put together and how it's gonna apply for our taxpayer. So if we start with the fact pattern here, we'll go through this and then we'll start looking at the K1 and the 1040. So. Uh, what we have here is we have John Smith. He is a Florida resident and he's a 20% shareholder in a Florida-based S corporation. Now, John actively participates in this business. And so he is paid a salary of 63,000 a year. And in addition to that, the S corporation covers his health insurance premiums, which are $7,000 for the year. Now, during the year, John loaned the S corp 30K in cash. Uh, which they needed to cover some operating expenses. And during the year, the S Corporation repaid $3,000 in cash, which comprised $1,050 of interest and then $1,950 in principal. Now, the principal balance at the end of the year was $28,050. And he did receive a 1099 INT uh, that reported the interest income that the S Corp paid to John on the note. Now in 2022, so this is last year, John's allocation of losses exceeded his stock basis, right? So he had a stock basis limitation. And so for that reason, he had suspended non-passive losses of $25,496, which were not deducted last year. They were carried forward to this year. All right, and then lastly here, uh, John is going to be claiming the standard deduction for 2023, so he's not going to be itemizing. All right, so let's start, let's start going through some of these elements on the K-1. So in part one and two on the left-hand side here, we just have information on the entity itself, so corporate EIN name, uh, where the return was filed, and then the total number of outstanding shares. So. The corporation has issued an outstanding 1,000 shares of stock at the start and the end of the year, right? So they didn't issue any new stock during the year. And in part two, we can see down here, John's share of, those, uh, of, of that total stock, right? So he owns 200 shares. And so his allocation of all of these items is gonna be 20%. So the other items in part two, we've got his ID, his shareholder name, and then in item I, uh, we have loans from shareholders. So if the shareholder didn't make any loans to the company during the year, uh, then this would uh, certainly be blank. But in our case, the fact pattern shows that John did make a loan during the year. So the outstanding principal balance at the end of the year is that $28,050 figure. So if we start with line one at the top here, this is the net amount of ordinary business income that is allocated to John for the year. So $10,579, that's just gonna be subject to ordinary income tax rates. And so generally, when you have flow through ordinary income or loss, it is reported on Schedule E, page two. So this is Schedule E of the Form 1040, page two. And in part two, we have income or loss from partnerships or S corporations. So the first entry on line A, we have the name of the S corporation, Fake Consulting Group, Inc. It is an S corporation for federal tax purposes. We have the EIN, and we are attaching the basis reconciliation, which is the new uh, form 7203. So we'll get to the 7203 
when we start to look closer at the basis reconciliation. So uh, we have the fake consulting group. Line A on the bottom here is separated into passive income or loss, non-passive income or loss. Because this is a, a business where John actively participates in the business, it is a non-passive activity to him. So we can see the non-passive income reported in, in column K. So $10,579 of non-passive income. Now, we'll get to this in more detail later, but you can see here that we also have an entry on row B uh, labeled PYA, which is uh, a prior year losses that were allowed this year. And the reason why these are being reported in the current year is because we're going to have sufficient basis this year to claim the losses. So if you have losses that are being freed up that are carried over from the prior year, you would have a PYA line entry and then the amount of loss that's being allowed in the current period. This was the amount of loss being carried over from last year, and John's going to be able to utilize all of it in this year, so the losses are being offset against his income from the current period. All right, then if we go on to some of the investment income here, so the S Corporation has a brokerage account where it invests in you know, some stocks and bonds, so there is some portfolio income flowing through here. We have interest income of $40. That's a separately stated item, right? So it's not included in line one. So we have $40 of interest income, and that flows through to Schedule B on John's 1040. So we can see here on the top line, we have Fake Consulting Group Inc. This is coming through from the K1. There's that $40 figure. And we can see also on the uh, next line, we have the interest that was reported separately on that 1099 INT from the shareholder loan. So there's that $1,000 $1,050 of interest on the shareholder loan. Now the other items here, we got some dividend income. So 112 of dividends uh, of which all of it is qualified. So that is also being reported on Schedule B in Part 2. So we have the uh, name of the S Corporation here, the total amount of dividend income. So that's ordinary dividend income. And then the qualified portion is reported in two places really, right? So first it's reported here on line 3A, so qualified dividends of $112. And then you would also want to have it reported on your uh, qualified dividends and capital gains worksheet. So on this worksheet here for qualified dividends and uh, capital gains, you would report the qualified dividend amount because that is subject to a lower tax rate than your ordinary income tax rate. All right. Now the next line item, we have net long-term capital gains. So $610. This is reported on Schedule D. So if we go to Schedule D of John's 1040, we can scroll down here to line 12 in the, in the long-term section. We have line 12 net long-term gain or loss from partnerships or S corporations, right? That were reported on a Schedule K-1. So we've got our $610 figure there. So that's reported correctly. Then moving on, we've got into the deductions section. So line 12, code A, so that is a charitable deduction. So line 12, code A is cash contributions to a charity and that's subject to a 60 percent of agi limitation now on john's return here the the charitable contributions would be reported on a schedule a right because it's an itemized deduction and so we can see here gifts to charity report on line 11 there's the allocation coming through from uh, the k1 now at the bottom here, you notice that the total itemized deductions for John is $1,057. Because his itemized deductions are so low, he's not going to be itemizing, right? So he's going to claim the standard deduction anyway, uh, which he has here on line 12, right, the 13850 But nevertheless, he did report, or he has at least accounted for uh, the allocation of charitable contributions that was reported to him on the K-1. All right, so next line item is box 16. So box 16 code A represents the amount of debt that was repaid, right? So uh, code 16, uh, box E, $1,950 of payments made on that shareholder loan. So that's the reduction to principal. 
and that's also reported in more detail on the loan statement. So if we look here, we've got um, the loan balance at the beginning of the year, the amount of advances, the principal repayments, right, 1950 and then the end of the year loan balance. Now, when you have this information, it can be used to populate the 7203. So if we have a look uh, back at John's return here, we go to the 7203. If we scroll down here, we're gonna need this information for part two, uh, section A and B. So section A here, uh, we've just got one debt arrangement between this shareholder and the S Corp. It was evidenced by a formal note, meaning uh, they had a, a written agreement, stated interest and principal uh, and payment terms. So the loan balance at the start of the year is zero. We've reported the $30,000 in loan. We've reported the 1950 in principal repaid, and we've reported the loan balance at the end of the corporate year. Now, in the debt basis uh, and allowable losses reconciliation, I won't go through this in too much detail. I've got a, a lot of other videos covering how to complete these sections. Uh, so I'll put a link to that playlist below. Uh, but as far as what's reported on the K-1, this is information included, uh, including what we have on line 16E here that is helpful in getting this section populated, right? You're gonna need to have this information in order to complete any kind of adjustments to basis and then recalculate the amount of uh, allowable losses and deduction items because you now have uh, debt basis in the S Corporation. Okay, so line 17A and AC. So 17A is just, it's uh, the amount of investment income that was allocated to you during the year. So that's the 112 and the $40. And then AC is the gross receipts uh, that were being allocated to you. So that's already being reflected in line one, right? There's, line one is our allocation of gross receipts and expenses. So AC is simply letting you know how much of that is included in there. Now the shareholder health insurance, very important. Uh, some K-1s will report this, uh, others don't. It's not required, but sometimes it's good practice uh, because it's helpful as a reminder that the shareholder uh, health insurance, the premiums of $7,000 were included in his wages. So his box one wages, and so we know now that he can claim the shareholder health insurance deduction on his return. So if we look at John's return, we can see his total wages from his W-2, box one wages, uh, $70,000, and that includes the 7,000 of shareholder health insurance premiums. So the health insurance premiums are reported on the 7206, Right, so shareholders, uh, if you're a more than 2% shareholder in S Corp and the S Corporation uh, pays for your health insurance premiums, right, it's through the company plan, you can deduct those payments uh, as a self employed health insurance deduction, but they also have to be included in your wages, right? So we've got the $7,000 uh, that was included in his wages there. His uh, Medicare wages in box five were 63000 So the self-employed health insurance deduction that he's gonna be eligible for is $7,000. So that's ultimately reported back up on schedule one. So schedule one in part two, we're, there we have our SC uh, insurance deduction for $7,000. Okay, so that's the SE deduction amount. Now for the QBI. Uh, so this is uh, a consulting company, so it is a specified service trader business. So these are the amounts of ordinary income uh, allocated to uh, John, that is qualified, base, uh, qualified business income and the allocation of W-2 wages. So these are amounts generally reported on the 8995. Uh, however, in this case, John had to account for the uh, free up of those prior year losses as well. Uh, so he had a $6,000 carryover. Uh, the QBI amount netted uh, to minus 14,917 this year. And there is, generally there is a uh, another QBI worksheet. Uh, okay, yeah, so there's the, so uh, what was reported in the current period, that's that 10,579 figure. Uh, and then what's allowed because of the free up of those prior year losses uh, gives them a, an adjusted amount of minus 14,917 for the year. And I also have 89.95 videos as well, so I'll, I'll put those uh, links below also if you want more detail on that. 
Okay, so that's the QBI thing. Now we have the basis worksheet. So uh, the S Corporation, you know, I, I think it's helpful if they track uh, what they think your basis is from both a stock basis and a debt basis perspective. But ultimately, it's the shareholders' uh, responsibility and they have to determine this at the shareholder level. And so as it's noted up here on the 7203, the shareholder completes 7203 and they, they include it with their tax return now. So the stock basis at the start of the year for John was zero, because uh, last year they had a lot of losses being allocated. Uh, so there are some increases and decreases for the current year period. Uh, but what's new for John this year is the debt basis, right? So he had a $30,000 loan to the company 1950 was repaid uh, principal wise so his total basis at the end of the year on the debt side before accounting for any losses he's going to apply against that is 28050 so the reason why his basis um, th this basis is going to be different at the shareholder level because at the shareholder level he is recording those losses um, from the prior year carryover all right, and then so lastly, well, actually, let's have a glance at the 7203 just so I can highlight some of these points. So uh, 7203, uh, the shareholders basis reconciliation, you could pull these items from the K-1 and from you know how they're being reported on the return. So there we see uh, the ordinary income uh, allocation, the interests, uh, the dividends, the capital gains that are increases to his basis. And then uh, again, the the allowable loss and deduction items in part three here. Uh, I've got a more lengthy tutorial covering that. I'll, I'll, again, I'll have that link below if you want to take a look at that, but won't go into that in too much detail here. And then lastly, in the K1, we've got this K3 notification. So the K2 and K3s were added in the last few years, uh, but there is a domestic uh, entity exception, which effectively says, uh, as it's noted here in the criteria, right, if the corporation has little to no foreign activity and all the shareholders are U.S. Uh, individuals, right, so they're U.S. citizens, resident aliens, or in some cases domestic trusts, then you don't have to do the K-3s. And so the corporation has elected not to do a K-2 or a K-3, and so they're letting the shareholder know uh, you're not going to get a K3. But if you decide that you need one, you not, you do want one, you can request that the S Corporation provide one to you. All right, so that covers it for this tutorial. I hope that was helpful. Uh, any questions, uh, feel free to leave a comment below. I, I do try to get to as many of those as I can, and I look forward to seeing you again on the next video. Thank you.